Hello and welcome to the first in a series of just three films about the higher level equilibrium topic from the IB Diploma Chemistry course. Um, here we're going to be looking at something called liquid vapour equilibrium and we're actually going to try and get through quite a lot in this film. We're going to try and use kinetic theory to explain why all liquids will evaporate before they boil and we'll hopefully understand what happens when a liquid boils. We'll understand what's meant by the equilibrium vapour pressure and how it changes with temperature for all liquids and we're also going to try and relate vapour pressure to the boiling point, to the enthalpy of vaporisation and to the intermolecular forces present in a liquid. So yeah, quite a lot to get through there. Now let's start off by talking about why all liquids evaporate before they boil. Okay, Puddles will evaporate, they'll be gone the next day even though the water never reached 100 degrees. Now we can understand that by thinking about kinetic theory and talking about the Boltzmann distribution of the energies of the particles in a liquid. And we can see that at a low temperature, this blue one, or even at a higher temperature, the red line, there are always particles that have quite a lot of energy. And if we're saying that this energy here is the amount of energy they need in order to escape from the liquid or to evaporate, then we can see there will always be particles that can evaporate. So this explains why all liquids will evaporate before they boil. And if they're evaporating at any temperature, then this means that at any temperature there will be vapour above the liquid. And just like any gas, the vapour will exert a pressure if it's placed in a container. And we call the pressure that the vapour above a liquid exerts, it's vapour pressure. Now, the funny thing about vapour pressure is, well, funny thing, is it's, it can be explained, but it's not necessarily intuitive, is that it will always reach a certain limit depending on the temperature. So if I place a liquid inside a conical flask, what we can say is that some of it will evaporate and before there's any vapour that's the only process that, that can occur. Once there is some vapour above the liquid, some of it can now condense. So we've set up this equilibrium. So this is why this vapour pressure is called an equilibrium vapour pressure because it's caused by this equilibrium and what is more, this behaves like most equilibria do in that it has an equilibrium constant K. Now, if you think about this, if this is a pure liquid down here, then its concentration, in other words, how many moles of it there are in every litre of liquid, will never change. So this quantity here, the concentration of the liquid, is a constant. And what that means is that the K, which, remember, never changes unless the temperature changes, is basically proportional to the concentration of the gas. And if K can't change unless the temperature changes, then the pressure of the gas above the liquid can't change unless the temperature changes. So it doesn't matter how big your flask is or how much liquid you put in it, we could fill this flask almost up to the top and the equilibrium vapour pressure would always be the same above the liquid unless we change the temperature. So now we're going to come back and have a look at the relationship between temperature and vapour pressure in a moment, but let's think about what happens when a liquid boils, because this also has to do with vapour pressure. Now, here we're on the left-hand side, we're looking at a liquid which is evaporating, but not boiling. So, there are particles which have enough energy to escape. If these particles tried to escape inside the liquid rather than from the surface, then they would form bubbles of gas in here. Okay, but if the pressure inside that bubble was smaller than the pressure outside, that is atmospheric pressure, then this bubble would never grow, it would just be collapsed by the external pressure. So in other words, these bubbles will only start to form when the vapour pressure of the liquid reaches atmospheric pressure. And we know that when a liquid starts to form lots of bubbles, when it's hot enough to form lots of bubbles, that's what we call a boiling liquid. right? So as soon as the vapour pressure reaches atmospheric pressure, these bubbles now have enough pressure to sustain themselves 
and they won't be collapsed by the outside pressure and the liquid will start to boil. So this is what we mean when we say a liquid boils. We're saying that its vapour pressure has reached atmospheric pressure. Whatever that atmospheric pressure might be, bear in mind, because atmospheric pressure can change depending on where you are. Now, let's have a look at a graph of some vapour pressures for three different liquids. We've got, uh, let's not worry too much about what they are, but diethyl ether, ethanol and water and also ethylene glycol. Now what we can see is we've got a line marked on this graph here and also indicated the normal boiling points of these liquids. Why is this called normal boiling point? Well this pressure here is equal to about one atmosphere. Okay, So 760 torr is one atmosphere of pressure. So at sea level we would expect water to boil at 100 degrees centigrade and in fact all these liquids boil at this pressure or that is to say when their vapour pressure reaches this pressure because this is the same atmospheric pressure for all of them. Okay, So we can mark on this graph atmospheric pressure and we can say that the temperature at which the vapour pressures of these liquids reach atmospheric pressure will be their boiling point. We can see their boiling points are different. Okay, We can also see that for every one of these liquids we've got this kind of curved shape when we plot vapour pressure against temperature and this is really important okay because you have to sketch these kind of graphs in your exams right so why should the vapour pressure increase as the temperature increases well now we can go back and look at our Boltzmann distribution again right and we can see that as our temperature increases the number of particles or rather the percentage of particles that have enough energy to escape from the liquid increases and if there's more particles that can escape there'll be more vapor above the liquid and its pressure will increase okay so we can explain why the vapor pressure of any liquid will increase as the temperature rises in terms of kinetic theory Okay, and we can also hopefully remember that these graphs will always take this kind of curved shape and to explain that is a little bit beyond what we're going to try and do here. Now, how does the vapour pressure that a liquid exerts depend on the intermolecular forces within that liquid? Let's have a look at these three liquids here. We're talking about pentane, C5H12, hexane, heptane and also octane but we're just going to focus on these three and again we can see we've got atmospheric pressure marked on here and when the vapour pressure of these liquids reaches atmospheric pressure this is when they boil so their boiling points are indicated these are the temperatures at which vapour pressure equals atmospheric pressure okay and we can see here that heptane has a higher boiling point than hexane which has a higher boiling point than pentane because Pentane has the highest vapour pressure at low temperatures. Why is that? Well, because pentane has the smallest molecules of these three, which means it's going to have the weakest van der Waals forces, if you remember, from the bonding topic. So, the stronger your intermolecular forces are, the harder it is for particles to evaporate from the liquid, and the lower your vapour pressure will be at any particular temperature. So, if we choose any temperature here, let's say 60 degrees, we can see that octane has the lowest vapour pressure at that temperature because it has the strongest intermolecular forces of all these liquids. All these liquids are non-polar molecules so that's why we're only talking about van der Waals forces there. But if we talk about liquids that have different kinds of intermolecular forces then we can kind of extend this discussion a bit further and if we now consider water, water remember is a polar molecule that hydrogen bonds Tetrachloromethane, which is actually a non-polar molecule but has a fairly high molecular mass, and pentane, which is a non-polar molecule with quite a low molecular mass compared to tetrachloromethane, we can see that water, again, at any chosen temperature, let's just choose um, this temperature here, which is about 36.1 degrees, okay, we can see that water has the lowest vapour pressure. Why is that? Because it can hydrogen bond, right? So if you're going to decide which liquid is going to have the lowest or the highest vapour pressure, you need to be able to consider its intermolecular forces. You need to have an understanding of the bonding topic so that you can decide what intermolecular forces are present in the liquid. Okay, so this actually brings together quite a lot of different understanding. 
Now then, let's try and link all these things that we've just covered to something called the enthalpy of vaporization. Now this is sometimes a little bit loosely defined, but the enthalpy of vaporization is the enthalpy change when one mole of a liquid turns into one mole of vapor at its boiling point. Okay, so in other words, how much energy do I have to put in to turn one um, mole of pentane at 36.1 degrees into one mole of pentane gas at 36.1 degrees. So we're turning the liquid into the gas, but we're not changing the temperature. Okay, and what we can see here, if we look at these enthalpies of vaporization, they're all positive quantities, right? It's always going to be endothermic. You're always going to be putting energy in to vaporize something. You can see here that heptane of these three liquids has the highest enthalpy of vaporization. Why is that? Well, because it's got the strongest intermolecular forces of these three. How would you be able to tell that just by looking at the vapor pressure curves? Well, if you chose some random temperature, say 20 degrees centigrade, you could see that heptane has the lowest vapor pressure at that temperature. Therefore, it's the hardest. It, it has, it, its particles have more difficulty evaporating from the liquid than the other two, and therefore their intermolecular forces must be stronger because the temperature is the same for all of them. And if their intermolecular forces are stronger, then they're going to have a higher enthalpy of vaporization. Okay, as I said at the start, there was a lot to get through in that film, um, but all the things are kind of, I suppose, related to each other very closely. And what's more, you need an understanding of intermolecular forces to try and really get your head around them. If there's anything that you didn't understand there, then please feel free to come and see me and post some comments. But if you've forgotten some of the stuff about intermolecular forces, it'd be a good idea to go back and revise some of that because you're going to need to have an understanding of it here. Um, yeah, so hopefully I'll uh, hear from you soon, either because you came to see me or because you posted a comment on YouTube.